Good morning, everybody. I hope you all recovered from the party yesterday. It was a good party, definitely one of the better ones I've seen at uh, conferences. So today I'm going to talk about some of the technology I've been using to save elephants. Now this sounds interesting, but by no means this is going to be an in-depth uh, technical talk. But don't worry, I know how it feels uh, to be stuck in the wrong room. I'm going to make this worth your while. I'm going to share some of my life lessons. And I hope that you can use these lessons on uh, your own life and you know, for the years to come. All right. The journey starts last year when I'm sitting in the back of a Toyota Land Cruiser. And it's this big 4x4. Four four. And I'm, I'm there in the back, and I'm cramped up together with my team and all the gear that we need and food for the upcoming five days. As we leave the populated areas, the roads become worse and worse. There are these huge potholes in the road. We hit one of those potholes, and we fly through the back of that truck. I can barely hold on to all my gear. One of the cans of beer bursts open, and after a few hours, some of the potatoes that we have with us starts to rot. The smell is terrible. It's like the aftermath of a good college party. Maybe some of you smelled it yesterday. It's a combination of the sweat of five men, beer, and rotten food. The sun sets, and when you're near the equator, like the sun setting is like turning off a light switch. It goes really fast. And the sky turns from blue to black. We drive along when suddenly the, sli uh, the driver, he slams on the brakes. We see a group of elephants appear from the forest in front of us and they cross the road. Now for me, it's, it's a magical thing to see these animals in the wild. And it's almost as if they know that we're there for them as if they are greeting us. We continue our journey, and after 14 very long and uncomfortable hours in the back of the truck, we finally arrive at our destination. Welcome, welcome. Hey. Oh. <laughs> 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 We are in Gabon. Gabon is a relatively small country in uh, Central Africa, uh, and it's very important for the forest elephants. In fact, it is their last safe haven, and it houses 70% of the global population of these animals. Now, I don't think that it will come as a surprise to you if I say that these elephants are in danger. Poaching is one of the reasons for this. It's where the elephants get slaughtered. Poachers have to cut off parts of the face of the elephant with an axe or a chainsaw to get the ivory to sell that illegally. It's, hor it's horrible. But there's actually uh, one other big threat to these elephants. Something that don't uh, not many people know exists. And it's something that we witnessed when we were visiting a small village in Gabon. Elephants had broken into their plantation and were now eating the food that these women need to survive 
and to provide for their families. And just to clarify, these women ju just do cannot just go to the supermarket. Do this is their primary source of food. And, and these are deadly conflicts because if these elephants are in the plantation and people try to go there, sometimes the elephants will charge and kill people. In retaliation, farmers plant traps. I've seen like wooden boards with long nails sticking through them and they scatter them through the plantation hoping that the elephants step on them to scare them away. Or sometimes they throw spears or use other weapons sometimes killing these elephants. And you know, this sounds terrible, and it is terrible, but from both perspectives, uh, perspectives, this is only logical. The elephants are just hungry. They're looking for food. And for us, elephants might like s like seem like magical creatures, but for them, they're just a pest eating their livelihood. So these are our very big uh, threats to the elephants, the human-elephant conflict. Even so, it's like um, just as big a threat as poaching itself. And by now you might be wondering, well, this is a tech conference, so when are we going to get to the juicy stuff? Don't worry, I'm not a biologist, I'm a nerd, just like you. And to explain a little bit on how I ended up in Africa, I have to ask uh, you a very important question. Who here of you knows what a autoexec.bat file is? Hands, please. Yes, we're getting old. <laughs> but still nice to see some hands raised. So when I was about 12 years old, my dad bought a new computer. I still actually don't know why he did buy it, because he had no experience with computers whatsoever, but it was like this amazing expensive machine. It was a Pentium computer with 8 megabytes of RAM and 265 megabytes of hard drive space. I remember thinking, who on earth would need more space than this? But, you know, I had no experience with computers as well. And I got this computer and it came installed with OS2 Warp. Now this is you know, some kind of operating system and I just wanted to do one thing and I wanted to play Doom and kill monsters. <laughs> but I was not able to run that game on that operating system. So I uh, tried to install MS-DOS. It came uh, on three floppy disks, and for the people that didn't raise their hand, just now a floppy disk is like a 3D printed save icon. Um, so, so I installed MS-DOS, and I had no clue what I was doing. Um, I tried to run the game again, but it still wouldn't load. I needed to, to do some weird stuff in that file, the autoexec.bat file. I needed to load my driver to my studio room player in like the high memory or something like that. I don't remember what it was. But my neighbor, he also had a computer and he printed out his version of that file. And I was basically just typing it over. And I remember typing go to that, go to this. And I clearly remember the first time that I saw the logic in a piece of code. I was like, go to, go to, ah, this is like, it's a logical thing. And for me, that was the start and I never stopped since. So fast forward to when I was like 30 years old. Uh, by then I had written like a million lines of code. And there came a moment where I started to wonder. I started to wonder with how many of these lines of code did I actually do some good in the world? And I started to realize that it's probably not that many. It was actually through reading a book, th through reading a book that uh, I had this realization. It, the book was called The Lean Startup. And every mistake that was described in that book, I was making it. And this made me so aware of the time that I was wasting. Um, a little bit about books. I definitely was the guy that said, who needs books? 
who reads books anyway because we have the internet and everything is on the internet. But um, looking back, I think you know every profound learning I had, whether it's on social skills, leadership skills, communication skills, I actually got them from books. So books are actually read books. <laughs> um, all right. So I think what I went through is 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 a common thing. You know, when you're younger, you're starting out uh, with with engineering then technology itself is enough to keep you happy. You know, learning new languages, learning new frameworks, it's really cool. But at some point in time, I think you, you hit a kind of ceiling. So uh, technology itself is no longer enough to keep you happy and you start looking for other things. Is that, can, s can some people, people relate to this, to, to this, Hans? Yeah. Luckily, I'm not the only one. My story makes sense. Um, so I think this is a common thing. But uh, I do want to challenge you uh, a little bit uh, on this. Because I believe that technology is just a means to an end. It's, it shouldn't be a goal in itself. Does that make sense? So... Uh, my question is, uh, what problems are you solving with technology? Are you building software for Putin's new rocket launcher? Or for an NGO that is working on sustainable energy? Now, of course, this is a bit exaggerated, but I do want you to take a little bit of time and think about, you know, what problems are you solving with technology? And the more important question is, do you care about those problems? Or are there any maybe other prob problems that you would rather be working on? Anyway, I was in a point of in my life that I wanted to make sure that I got the most out of my lines of code. Not just by writing code more efficiently, but I wanted to work on real world, world pro problems, basically. And um, how do you go about this? For me, it was a journey of, of a couple of years and, and just going out there, just going to meetups, uh, talking to people, figuring out what it is that I wanted to do. It, was, it wasn't like an, that I had an aha moment and it became clear to me that this was the purpose in my life. No, it had, I had to go out there and find it. You know, You have to solve these things on your own. And now I'm working at a company called Q42. It's an agency in the Netherlands. And within that company, I run a small department with a small team called Hack the Planet. And with Hack the Planet, we can use our technical skills to solve the bigger problems of this world. And the projects that we do are, are going into all kinds of different directions. This year we launched a online interactive to educate kids about the, s the dangers of online sexual abuse. But we also created a virtual reality documentary where we created peace between two rivaling tribes in Uganda. But today I'm here for the elephants. So, how did we? What we were? What were we doing in Africa? At some point in time, we were talking to rangers, the people in the fields, protecting the elephants, and they were telling us that they use uh, camera traps. I think I have a slide of that. Yes. So these are skinny elephants, as you can see. They're very hungry, so that's why they break into plantations. And this is a camera trap. Uh, rangers use these a lot. They uh, strap them to a tree, and when there is a movement in front of that camera, it takes a picture. And we were talking to these rangers, and they told us, well, every half a year we have to go to the camera trap to collect the SD card and change the batteries. And then we can see, well, there was a elephant here six weeks ago, and there was a poacher here eight weeks ago. And that is when we thought, 
wait a minute, what if we could create a camera that could alert rangers in real time of what is happening in their park? But how do you do that? Um, and I definitely didn't completely want to reinvent the wheel. I didn't want to waste years and years to come up with uh, a new product or something like that. So we found smart, pragmatic ways to use as much existing stuff as we could find to solve this problem. So we took that existing Bushnell camera trap and we opened it up and we added some of our own hardware and we put a Wi-Fi SD card in there. Wi-Fi SD card is just an SD card that creates a Wi-Fi hotspot. And then we created this thing. It is a, a mini computer. It's actually a microcontroller containing a Raspberry Pi for a compute. And the camera trap sends a message to this microcontroller. It then turns on the Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi downloads the images from that camera trap that is uh, exposing them via the Wi-Fi hotspot and then uses a machine learning algorithm to automatically de detect what is on the photo. Is it an uh, elephant, a rhino, another animal, or maybe a human? And then the thing on top with the, the blue condensator, it's a rock block, which is a satellite modem that we use to send this information through space directly to the phone of the rangers. And in this way, we created a hardware setup that uh, could create real-time alerts from the forest, even in places where there's no cell phone coverage, to alert rangers of what is happening in their park in real time. Now, this was only part of the problem, because we also needed to uh, run a machine learning algorithm on that Raspberry Pi. And me personally, I had very little experience with machine learning. I've never done too much uh, with it. I think even machine learning has like, for me it had like this magical thing, it's just like this magical domain. But I needed to solve this problem. So I googled and the first thing I stumbled upon was uh, fast AI. I think in the world of machine learning you have like two sides, it's you have the, the TensorFlow side and the PyTorch side, and FastAI is a, is, a, is a framework on top of PyTorch that allows you to uh, play with machine learning, and they actually have an excellent course. So if you're interested in machine learning, I can highly recommend that course. It's called, uh, it's called Making Neural Nets Uncool Again. <laughs> and it's a, it's an odd name, but it's really funny because this guy, he really tries to explain and uh, remove the magic unicorn sauce of machine learning and drills it down to what it is. It's just math. It's no magic. Everybody can do it. And with FASA, I was actually pretty quickly uh, getting good results of training a model on the data set that I had that could recognize elephants, humans, and others. So I played it, uh, around with that for, uh, for a couple of weeks and then I tried to run that model on a Raspberry Pi. Now, after a lot of pip install headaches and uh, pulling my hair out to try, try and get it up and running, I finally did, but it was slow as hell. It took like 20 seconds to classify a single image, and it was crashing half of the time. So uh, clearly this wasn't going to work for me. And then I needed to go to TensorFlow. TensorFlow Lite, is a light version of TensorFlow, which makes sense, which is designed to run on hardware, on your phone, but also on a Raspberry Pi. And I basically went through the same process. I, I took some samples on how do you train an image classification network, and um, the results are I got were terrible. It was even like in the comments of the samples of Google themselves, well, this script produces terrible results, but you get the idea. Well, I was like, well, that's not useful at all. So I wasted uh, some time on that until I found a service called AutoML. And AutoML is basically a, a service of Google where you upload your data set, uh, you upload your CSV file that splits your data into training and testing, and then you say, 
train and it spits out a model. And that actually worked very well. Now, I must admit to you that it hurt my ego a little bit that I was beaten by a machine to train a machine learning model, which is kind of weird. But, you know, it solved my problem, so it was all, uh, all good and fine. And doing this, uh, looking back at the past year that I've been working on this, I must admit that a lot of the times I had the feeling, it, it basically felt like that, that, uh, that uh, I was that little boy again, you know, not knowing what I was doing, but knowing what problem I was trying to solve. And it felt, the past year felt like that. So a lot of the times I felt way out of my depth. I thought, who am I to be training a machine learning model or, you know, getting it running on a Raspberry Pi? But I came to realize that this feeling of not knowing what you're doing, being way out of your depth, you, you can call it imposter syndrome, I guess. You know, it never goes away. I'm now 40 years old and I've had that feeling when I was 12 and I still do. And that's okay. I think you should, should just embrace that feeling. In fact, even though it feels really uncomfortable, I think it's a good place to be because it means that you're really pushing the boundaries of what you are doing with your own skill set. Does that make sense? I hope it does. All right. So um, I, I got that uh, up and running. And um, uh, now it was basically time to get it working. So I want to uh, take you back to Africa again. So while I was in Africa, it gave me a very humbling feeling. Being in the middle of the rainforest, surrounded by miles and miles of forest as far as the eye can see, with no humans there, it was it was very humbling and it made me it made me kind of philosophical so bear with me I'm warning you um, <laughs> I think I think and I've been thinking about this uh, a lot lately I think almost all of the problems that we are facing the big problems like the the economical social uh, ecological problems that the humanity is facing today is because we are detached. That's what I felt, you know, I was sitting in the rainforest and I became aware of how different that is, being in nature, living in nature from how, how I grew up. And I think most of you grew up in a city detached from nature. And I think we as humans think we are better than nature and see it as a resource to exploit for our own gain. But that's just simply not true. We are nature, and I think we can only solve these big problems if we start seeing nature as our, as our most precious resource again, and not shareholders, profit, or anything like that. Now, I think nature will be fine in the long run. You know, we're not doing it, we're, we're not solving these problems for nature. If we don't get our act together, then she will just shake us off like a wet dog after a swim. We're doing this for ourselves, for, for the future of, of humanity. Uh, sorry, I'm warned, I warned you, this is, I'll, I'll stop here, but I think this is why I like working on these conservation projects uh, so much now. All right, we had a working system, we had the hardware working, we had the machine learning model working. And now it was time to test it out. So we jump back into that truck, into that 4x4. Four four, and we drive to a forest near a small village. And this village was suffering from human elephant conflicts. And we had been working towards this moment for the past year. So we jump out of that car like a couple of excited teenagers. Yes, we're going to do this. And the ranger's like, shh. And he listens. And he smells. And he explains to us that going into the forest is really dangerous. Because this forest is full of elephants. And if we go in there and we surprise one, then it might charge us and kill us. 
and it will run through the forest like there is no forest, and I will probably stumble over the first twig I encounter. So he makes sure it's clear. We enter the forest, and he's looking for an active elephant trail. He's looking at the ground, at the trees, and it's, it's like magic seeing these guys work. They see a pile of elephant poop, and they can exactly see how many days ago this was. Anyhow, we find a good spot, and we deploy our cameras. We deploy the camera trap uh, like a meter of the ground, so it can clearly see the elephant. And uh, we put a ladder against the tree, and the, s the, s the mini computer, we put that high up in the tree. It's powered with a small solar panel that re recharges the batteries that is running uh, the Raspberry Pi. And uh, we put it high up so that the satellite modem can get a good clear view of the, sky, uh, of the sky to get the message out. So we deployed the camera and we had configured it to send a WhatsApp message to the phone of my colleague when the camera saw a movement, an elephant or maybe something else. That night, I'm lying in my bed, and the worrying starts. It's, it's bloody hot there. I cannot sleep. I hear the mosquitoes zooming around my head. Luckily, I'm in a net. But I think, oh man, is this going to work? I, it, feels, it, feels, mm, it doesn't feel very good if your code is running somewhere and you cannot see it. You don't know if it's, if it's working. You don't know if there's bugs in there. So I was worrying that you know, we were there for nothing. And I think about a home, a conversation that I had with my oldest daughter, Julia. She is, uh, then she was 12 years old. And just a day before I left for Africa, she asks me, so dad, what are you going to do in Africa for three weeks? And I'm saying, I'm going to deploy eight camera traps. And she's like, do you need that, much ti that much time for that? <laughs> and I tried to explain to her, you know, what we're trying to achieve there, but she's clearly not impressed. Teenagers, right? <laughs> but the worst thing is, is that I start to believe it myself. So uh, while I'm lying there, I'm like, oh man, what is this not going to work at all? And <coughs> then suddenly my thoughts are interrupted by some strange sounds. Through the thin wooden wall beside me, I hear a phone going off. It is that phone of my colleague receiving notifications. And the next morning, he confirms. The camera trap we deployed the day before had reported to have seen multiple images of elephants. Yes. But since we use that satellite modem, we cannot actually see the image itself. So what we do is we only send the metadata of the classification. So we only send that an elephant has been seen and what the accuracy of the model is. So we want to go back there to double check if it's correct. We go back to the first camera. We open it up, pop out the SD card, I put it in my laptop and I go through the images. Blank. Blank. A monkey. Not an elephant, blank. I'm like, shit, <laughs> this is not working. I take a closer look at the images, and I see this weird branch in view. And this weird branch suspiciously looks like the trunk of an elephant. So that was a, it was a good learning there, that um, no matter what you do, these factors can still bite you in the ass. So we reposition the camera to move away from that branch and hope that it worked. We go to the next camera that we deployed, and this is what we see. Yeah. Ah, that's, yeah. that's the eye. Yeah. It's the eye of the that. elephant. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
could it be that it's actually the elephants that are inside the fence now? Voilà, c'est sûr que c'est le groupe là. So, parce que ce sont trois là-bas. Oui, et on a fait mes trois là-bas. Oui, trois ici. Oui, oui. c'est c'est la même groupe. Ça peut être le même groupe. Holy crap! Not only did our system work, but we actually caught the same group of elephants on camera that had broken into the plantation of these women you saw before. And they were now having an all-you-can-eat buffet in that plantation. So this proved that our system worked and it could provide valuable information to rangers to keep elephants and people safe. Because if rangers know when elephants are approaching a village, they can inform the villagers or they can try and scare away the elephants. When we were in the plantation, uh, we were walking there, we saw these big oil drums with uh, wooden sticks on them. We, we asked uh, the rangers, what are these for? And they say, well, if we hear elephants, sometimes we start banging on a drum to try and chase them away. Now, at the end of our trip to Gabon, we were invited by uh, the minister uh, Lee White. And um, it, was, it was a very weird setting. It, 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 this we, we enter this room and there's the minister and the head of anti-poaching. And the minister, he, he really knows what he's talking about. He's been working his whole life in the area of conservation. And uh, he is in charge of protecting the flora and fauna of the entire country of Gabon. And we sit there and it's a very weird atmosphere. The head of anti-poaching is a huge guy in military outform and he's, he's, he's kind of scary. There's a big elephant skull in the corner of the room and we sit there and we explain to him what we have done. We explain the technology that we developed and how it can help rangers uh, to keep uh, elephants and, 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 and humans uh, safe. Now, we cannot really read these guys. They have like steel faces and we don't know whether they are impressed with what we're doing or not. And at the end of the meeting, the minister you says know, it this. It sounds dramatic to say it's a matter of life and death for the Echo Guards, but fewer of our Echo Guards will die um, and more poachers will be caught if we can deploy this technology. Now, even though I think that this will still not convince my daughter Julia, because this is not on TikTok, <laughs> um, any doubt I had was now gone. They basically told us that with this technology, we could be saving the lives of people. And I could never have imagined that my programming skills would bring me into the African rainforest. And the funny thing is that what I do is, is basically the same. I'm still writing codes most of the time. I'm still a nerd. But why I'm doing it, it has changed. And I don't think we are done yet. There are still so many challenges out there. And, and the good thing is that wh when you're out there, you see spot new opportunities. So when the ranger was ta talking uh, about the, the steel oil drum that they use, we had another idea. And we are now developing an elephant repeller or elephant scarecrow or uh, how you want to say it. It's basically a system of a loudspeaker and a, f and a flashing light that we can deploy and it works together with the camera traps. So if the camera trap sees an elephant, it will send a LoRa message to that system that is uh, strategically deployed around the village. And it's if an elephant walks by, then suddenly he hears sounds and, and noises and, and sees flashes of light coming from that direction. And with this system, we basically hope to automate that oil drum and steer elephants away from villages. Um, and I think this illustrates how, uh, how you can see spot more opportunities when you're there in the wild. And before, before I want to um, 
leave you uh, with this session. I want to end with um, maybe a frustration that I have. And I hope uh, there will be plenty, time, plenty of time after the talk to uh, challenge me on this frustration or ask questions about the system. But, uh, and I hope I don't offend anybody with this. But the frustration that I have, and I've been guilty of this myself, is that so many of the brightest and most talented engineers are wasting their time building useless things. Building a chatbot that everybody hates. Or uh, building uh, a system for making people buy more stuff online that they don't really need. And this is, this is what uh, frustrates me, because there are so many good causes out there that could desperately need our help. And these organizations usually don't know what is possible with, te with technology, and they cannot see the opportunities, especially not the way that we are used to working with technology in, in the big organizations. So these are organizations like Greenpeace or, or WWF, that are uh, working on regreening projects or foundations that are trying to s uh, uh, tackle humanitarian crisis or protect endangered uh, species. And these kind of projects we need for our own future, basically. Now, I'm not saying that you should all become a Greenpeace activist and chain yourself to a tree. No, um, not at all. But I do think that we have a moral obligation to make a conscious choice on what we are working on. And I think most of us, of you, can make a choice what, we, what you uh, work on. You have that choice, even though it sometimes means not going for the biggest paycheck. And of course, everybody decides um, uh, for themselves what they're working on. I'm just saying that what I found, what I learned in, in the past few years, is that it is possible to code your way to a better world. So my question to you is basically, what do you really care about? What problems would you really like to be solving? And why not, why not go for that? Because if you make the right decision, then what I've learned is that it's so much more satisfying doing your job. And you will be able to do some good in the process. Thank you very much. I don't know if it's... Uh, any questions? You go. So the question... So the question is, do the poachers d see the cameras and destroy them? Yes, this happens. Um, to be honest, it's just part of the game. And not only poachers, also elephants. Uh, destroy them. It's actually that uh, elephants have a ge very good scent and if they smell something that has been touched by humans, they sometimes just completely destroy the cameras or even uh, push down the entire tree. So um, yes, we try to hide the cameras as, as much as we can and like I said, the mini computer is very high up in the tree, so uh, poachers usually don't see that, uh, but it's part of the game. Yes. Good question. How do we get funding? It's actually one of the most challenging things on working in this space. So, uh, like I mentioned, uh, Hack the Planet is part of Q42, which is a agency of 100 people, and we do commercial projects. Um, and uh, Q Q42 basically donates 10 to 15 percent of the annual profit into the projects that we are doing. So. Um, that is one way we get funding, but to be honest, uh, hardware development is very expensive. 
actually, what I found is hardware, working with hardware is very hard, especially in these times when Raspberry Pi seems to be more extinct than elephants. But um, what we do for these kind of projects uh, is uh, try to get funds uh, from like WWF or apply for other funds, um, which uh, I'm not a fund, I'm, uh, I'm not really fond of writing these applications, but we need to. So. More questions? Have I offended anybody? No? no? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> they all put like a red paper in the in the in the thing. I will count them. Yes. Well, yeah. It, it's it's for me also. It's kind of an, an a different way. It's it's not giving a talk on a technical subject, but it's more you know on life. So sorry if that was not your expectation. But <laughs> last questions. Anyone? Oh, see a hand there. Good question. I've thought about that as well. Um, you know, I think the honest answer is yes, because if there's like this alarm going off and poachers know that what kind of system it is, then they might know where to go. But I, I don't think it's an it's a real problem. Usually, it's it's um, there there are different kinds of uh, problems that these elephants are facing. Like I said, it's poaching and human elephant conflict. And usually where uh, there are human-elephant conflicts, there is not a lot of poaching going on. Poachers are usually active on in more remote areas of the park. So uh, I don't think it's going to be a problem. The same goes basically for the old oil drum. So if you know the oil drum is going off, then, oh, there must be an uh, elephant somewhere. Um, but I don't think it's going to be a problem because usually these two uh, problem areas are separated. Yeah, so the question is, uh, what about maintenance of the hardware? Um, and software, yeah. So um, I actually write, wrote a lot of unit tests for this, which is not something I always do, to be honest. Uh, so that's one way of, of you know, keeping, it, keeping it up and running. Uh, recently, we got the cameras back to do a software update. So it basically means you know, getting them from the field, shipping them back to us, and then we ship them back to Africa. We do. We have trained the rangers, so um, it's one thing to create this technology, but it has to be simple enough for the rangers themselves to work with. Otherwise, you know, it's useless. So we train the rangers on how to install the cameras, how to install the smart bridges or the uh, the mini computers, and uh, they have actually they have been there for six months. The cameras, and they have actually repositioned the cameras uh, many times. So they. they yeah, that works. But yeah, maintenance of hardware is hard. And we're, you know, it's very small scale. It's like we recently uh, shipped another 15 cameras, um, but it's small scale. So it's not, we don't have like a support department or anything like that. Any more questions? All right. Oh, one more. Yeah, um, I did. I actually, I think I, I, I have a branch somewhere that basically has this functionality, but it's it's really difficult. It's um, the same goes for LoRa. I don't know if there are any any LoRa specialists he specialists here, but <laughs> like LoRa and the satellite modem that we're using are designed to only send very tiny amounts of data. So, for instance, the satellite modem that we're using. Uh, only allows you to send um, 340 bytes. And this is not a lot of data. So being smart with bits and bytes, uh, I'm able to send like 55 image classification results by only sending the metadata. But if we were to send an image, I've seen, you know, if you, if you take an image and you make it really tiny, like 100 by 100 pixels, and compress it really, really um, down, then you still have like, uh, like 1,500 uh, kilobytes that you need, and you need like four or five satellite messages to get that out. 
and sometimes it takes like 10 minutes to get it out and you have to stitch it back together on the back end. So we basically, long story short, we decided not to go down this route. Technically it's possible, but it's, yeah, I don't think it's a good idea. That's it, any last questions? Ah. The elephants are, are are hanging around. Yeah. Um, so we we implemented some kind of uh, a debounce logic. So if the uh, camera takes a picture and it takes another one and takes another one, then we wait and collect the data and then we ship it and then we send it and then for like five or ten minutes we don't send any m other uh, events. So this is a way to basically mitigate the system triggering all the time. And what we have seen so far is that uh, usually you get like uh, the elephant walks past and it, it takes like a couple of images and then uh, it moves away. It's I've never seen an elephant, you know, chilling in front of our camera trap for hours on end. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs>